me Fighting for your civil rights Out on the cruel streets tonight For Sylvia and Marcia Life was harder than you ever know A silly place to start Where others just threw a stone joined today and uh, I'd like to introduce again my good friend Philippa Ryder. Philippa, welcome back to uh, LGBTQ plus life. Thank you very much, Mick. Sam. Thanks, thanks so much for having me on again. Yeah, Philippa, per, uh, the major reason why we're uh, keen to talk to you today is because in days gone by, you were an activist, and then you became a writer, but now you're an author. You're a published <laughs> author. Um, that must feel good. Oh, it does. It does. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the book, which is a memoir, took me 10 years to write, to, uh -huh. to edit, and to, to basically compose the... the <sighs> To, to compose what I wanted to say, because there's a lot in the book, but there's a lot that has, has to be left out for various reasons, both personal reasons and for um, legal reasons, actually, because okay. some of the stuff that I that I had written initially was was kind of um, the, the publisher went, uh, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say okay. that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So it is wonderful. I mean, when I went into um, Dubray Books in Grafton Street uh, about, what was it, four weeks ago, and I saw the book on the shelf and I wasn't expecting it to be there because yeah. it wasn't even supposed to be released until oh. the following week. Mm -hmm. And it was just, oh my goodness, uh, Mix. I, I literally, I, I, I nearly fainted with, with the shock and the, real, and the delight. The realization of a dream. The realization of a dream, yes, but also I was so worried about the reaction of both mm -hmm. my community, uh -huh. the, uh, the trans community, the wider LGB community, but also family members and friends and work colleagues um because there's stuff in there that they that they didn't know about and mm. i bared my soul because i felt that i had to yeah oh yeah you uh, you certainly do and that's why it's a very revealing it's a very candid book in that regard was that always your intention it was it was yeah. um originally <coughs> i had i had a, a more personal stuff in there um and everything i i that is now in the book has been run by Helen and our daughter Jenny. So mm. they approved everything that went in there and it has caused issues. It's there 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 were issues with Helen's family um mm. who were very surprised at some of the stuff. So it's a case of <clears throat> look, I wanted to bear my soul. I want to help others. Mm -hmm. And helping others actually mix was 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 what I, why I wrote the book as well as getting it out. Um, the personal story, because yeah. as we know from from marriage equality and repeal the eighth, the personal stories won those referendums. Absolutely, absolutely, yep. Though it's a, it's unique almost in the annals of uh, of Irish biography in that sense of the word. While there were other people uh, have told their stories in different contexts, this is very much a comprehensive uh, uh, bio autobiography because you wrote it yeah. yourself. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Helen read it 12 times to, to, to prove it <laughs> and hey, hates the book now. She can't read it anymore. Indeed, yeah. I can't either. But um, yeah, no, all my own words, um, a couple of suggestions from the editor and a couple of suggestions from, from Helen. So yeah. that is basically it. All yeah. my own words. So how did it come about in the sense, clearly you sat down to compose it. Did you approach Mercy or did Mercy or approach you? What, what was the, uh, uh, the timeline on that? Okay, the timeline was that when I came back from my surgery in Charing Cross in 2011, mm -hmm. my, my very best friend, Declan, uh, he suggested that I write the book. Mm 
mm -hmm. uh, because he said you you have a really really interesting story and i said well look deck apart from the obvious what else has happened in my life so mm -hmm. i but anyway i started putting a few notes down on paper and then i turned uh, i went to the laptop and i expanded on it and suddenly i had a quarter of a million words mix you mm -hmm. know oh um, sure yeah uh, and I went, wow, this is this is amazing, but I can't publish all this because it's just it. A lot of it would be irrelevant and not not of interest mm -hmm. to the general public. So around that time, though, this was maybe four six uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I bumped into a friend of mine, Tara Flynn, mm -hmm. a comedian, and she mentioned about getting a book published by Mercier. And okay. I said, oh, I've written a book. Um, uh, could you give me the editor's details? So that's what happened. It went off to Mercier. Uh, sorry, uh, I met the editor, uh, one of the editors anyway, and uh, she, he he said, sounds really interesting. I love your story. Send me the manuscript. Okay. So I did. Unfortunately, a couple of months later, he left Mercier. <laughs> Nobody had access to his emails. Nobody else in the company knew that the, that the, that the, uh, that the uh, manuscript was with them. So it was during the uh, period last year, at the, at the beginning of last year, when Helen and I were due to go on the Late Late Show. Mm -hmm. And I decided it, it was a great opportunity to promote the book. Mm -hmm. I knew Mercier still had it. And uh, so I emailed them and I said, listen, what's the story? It'd be a great, great, way to publicize mm -hmm. and they said oh my god we never got the manuscript because it was in the other person's account mm -hmm. can you send it again okay. and a day later i had the contract you know so uh now it had to be seriously edited next because mm -hmm. it went from 250 to 125,000 mm -hmm. words and then once i got the 125,000, uh mary my editor said uh okay the most we can publish is a 70,000 word mm -hmm. and I nearly cried because I had already cut so much um, and then 70,000 was just not achievable so I managed to cut it down to 83,000 words mm -hmm. and I feel that it hangs together it tells my story it's it's hopefully it will be of help to the community yeah, yeah. I mean, I should uh, tell listeners that 83,000 words still translates into 258 pages, which is not a, not a small book. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not what we call a slim volume. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But yeah. then I've had 60, then I've had 60 years to, uh, to yeah. come up with anecdotes uh, and, and, and incidents <clears throat> and so on. <laughs> yeah. uh, you don't look at Philippa, you don't look at that's right. <laughs> but interestingly, you, Thanks, you, you and I, uh, the last time we did it, recorded an interview was, um, I think it was 2015, just around uh, the time of the passing of the marriage equality legislation and the gender recognition legislation. There were, I mean, you may have been writing a book at that time, but uh, I had no clue. So I was very uh, ple pleasantly surprised when I did read a couple of weeks ago that it was now published and I've since read it and uh, enjoyed it immensely if that's the uh, the correct term for it but I did I, did, I, I found it, uh, uh, it it's always difficult when you know the person that it's written about but uh, as I, say, it was, uh, I found it very insightful because I found out a lot of things about you that I thought I knew but didn't know mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. um yeah it was that was my intention all right to to kind of as i say bear, bear my soul and um just let people see i i i kind of feel that it, to to a lot of people i was seen as a goody two shoes yeah. um nothing ever happened in my life that that uh, uh that was uh, any way controversial or different or whatever mm -hmm. apart from being trans yeah so in a way, I got a kind of a, 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 a small pleasure out of uh, denying that myth and showing that that in fact, hey, I was human. And mm. after all, when we uh, told my daughter Jenny some mm. year, some uh, months ago, uh, when she read the book, and she had no idea about some of the incidents in there, mm -hmm. and 
one of the reporters, I think it was the Irish Independent uh, reporter said, so when you read some of the passages in the book, what did you think? And Jenny just laughed and she says, well, I'm just I'm just happy that my parents are human, mm -hmm. that they have their own little foibles, that they have their own little issues and so on. They're not perfect people. Nobody is, you know, yeah. and I thought that was a very mature. Well, I mean, she's 26 True. now, so she's yeah. well able to to express herself. Mm -hmm. So I do feel that, um, you know, th that it was important to see to show that. I have mm -hmm. all the other issues, all the other problems and mm -hmm. challenges that everybody else has. But then I've also got both my trans status and my bisexuality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, can I come back to something that, as you say, there's a lot that they took out of the book. And I was just curious because um, when I was reading it and I because the first time I ever came across trans was in literature um, and then I came across it in music. Um, you don't allude to that. Was that deliberate or because your experiences were different? Now, they, as I say, I first came across descriptions of trans mm. in about 1968, 1969, oh, wow. and uh, because my father brought home certain books. <laughs> That's another, <laughs> that's another story in itself. Um, so I remember when you and I spoke about it uh, a couple of years ago, you talked about the influence of your mother and certain things like that, but um, you didn't seem to uh, refer to it in the book about any influences that you might have come across in, say, music, film, literature. Were they there, Philip, or um, were they later developments? Um, actually, a little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, what happened was, I like I grew up in the seventies, mm -hmm. and Ireland was 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 a place that was run by the Catholic Church, and mm -hmm. it was it was uh, there was no information about anything mm -hmm. um, LGBTQ related. Mm -hmm. But so I very much didn't allow anybody to see uh my my feminine feelings at all because it simply wasn't acceptable now i was delighted in the 70s to have my long hair and so on but then all the all the my, my friends did as well male or female had long yeah. hair and uh so it was it was a case of um being influenced but on a on a on a very base level and i didn't allow it to influence my my attitudes or my my mm. anything that i said or my dress sense or anything like that so it would have been the likes of bowie um of course um mm. and then i had some some very um <laughs> so, so, so some women that i really aspired to be farrah fawcett majors kate bush those mm. sort of singers which who weren't really talking about trans they weren't talking about lgbt mm -hmm. issues but but they were very much my ideal girl and um mm -hmm. maybe something that i would be I would aspire to but you yeah. mentioned as well about my about my mother and without without a doubt from a very very early age i was influenced by her and her femininity mm -hmm. and again she was somebody that i used as a role model you know um but in the 70s, particularly in Ireland, there was no chance of finding out anything. And if if you stood out at all, you were ridiculed. Yeah, it, it's interesting you should say that because uh, I grew up uh, in the late 60s, but I also, I was still at university in the early 70s. I left in 72. Mm. Um, and it was around that time we got Ziggy Stardust and uh, yeah. uh, Hunky Dory and things like that. And I remember the first time we really saw something like that was, I think it was the cover of Hunky Dory where David yes. Bowie has a dress. And yeah. Uh, it was very interesting. My memory of that is to see the responses. People were either, oh, look at him, he's a queer, or those of us yeah. who were thinking, wow, isn't this guy really out there? And we loved the music and it transcended it. Um, now, uh, how early did you discover that, uh, Philip? Or were you early teens or uh, what was the situation? Yeah, it would have been early teens, Mix. Mm. Um, and as well as that, 
uh, of course, then we had Queen and Freddie Mercury, and oh, sure. the, the, I can't can't remember the the, the song title, but uh, when the entire band uh, went in drag on the video, I want to break free. <laughs> yeah, I want to break free. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I mean that they, they, they couldn't go back to America as a result of that. Exactly. Well, I was going to say that uh, yeah. Queen Queen were huge in America until they did that album, uh, mm. and that, that video. They never basically never sold anything after it, which is bizarre, isn't it? But the but the one that uh, blew me away, um, and mm. I always say, if I was on a desert island, uh, this would probably be the album I would take, and that was Transformer, Lou Reed. It was Lou it, Reed. Ju- it, it mm. just absolutely blew me away, and I can still pick it up. You know, what, what is it? Fifty years later, I can mm. still put it on the. Uh, uh play it and it still has that same resonance for me it was just uh a whole uh it, 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 how could i put it it was just uh it, it opened it, it a, a light went on is all i can say mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah nice way to put it yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. yeah. but as you know from reading the book uh, music yeah. plays yeah. such a huge part of my life not so much in respect of the trans aspect or even yeah. the lgbtq um but just purely because i love music so much and i've mm-hmm. got so many different uh artists that i follow and albums yeah. that i get so it's a case of a, it is such an integral part of who i am sure. and that's mm-hmm. why i have i don't know if you listen to it or not but the, the spotify playlist mm-hmm. where i had a song for each chapter I um, haven't I listened think... to that. I'll have to look. I'll ah, have to. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and they were they were songs that were relevant to each of the chapters. Um, mm-hmm. So, for instance, the first one was "Imagine," which I clearly by uh, by Lennon, of course. Um, uh, but I, and I clearly remember one of the first times that I that I ever dressed when I was about ten or eleven, mm-hmm. and "Imagine" was playing on the radio as I went up to my sister's bedroom. Mm-hmm and put on her skirt for the very very first time mm-hmm. so it's that sort of thing and then i met helen and it was it's the star trek uh star trek mm-hmm. theme tune and then mm-hmm. uh we had jenny and it's mm-hmm. uh stevie wonders isn't she beautiful you know mm-hmm. so stuff like that that means something to me and then later on in the in the uh in the um uh, book i kind of my music interests develop into Tori Amos and Sigur uh, Ross and um, quite a few others. So yep, it's yep. I, it's getting a lot of uh, positive feedback, the playlist. So yeah, mm-hmm. have a listen. I will indeed. I will indeed. Tell me then, uh, Philippa, um, let's move on to uh, your time as an LGBTQ plus activist, because that's where you and I uh, first uh, mm. uh, met, particularly through Tenny. Now, my uh, memory uh, at the time, and it's quite clear in that sense that when we talk about 2012, it was not by any means clear that the legislation we ended up with was what was being proposed at the time. In fact, quite the opposite. The original mm-hmm. Gender Recognition Commission that was set up by Eamon O'Keefe, uh, most people in the trans community were horrified, not only mm-hmm. with the composition, but what they were proposing. What's your memory of that time, Philippa? Mm-hmm. Well, it was very much, I had stepped back at that stage mix from um, from mm-hmm. the likes of Tenny because I had had my surgery the year before and mm-hmm. I just needed to come to terms with my, mm-hmm. my uh, you know, uh, uh, being me and living my life um, as Philippa. Mm-hmm. So, from that point of view i wasn't really involved in the legislation i mean uh, i think i was at a couple of meetings yeah, all right um, sure, yeah. yeah yeah um and i remember going to say the doll once or twice with sarah phillips and so on mm-hmm. um and i i do think yeah the the initial legislation needed to be modified but then i suppose any any legislation um, yeah. needs, is, and, and at least they did listen to the trans community. Yeah. So, and what was produced was a very, very good piece yeah. of legislation. It still has its faults, of course, uh, but yeah, yeah we're, we're yeah. getting there and hopefully yeah, the we, uh, review. Yeah. yeah, but what was interesting, and again, I don't mm. want to uh, dwell too much on that, was what was proposed um, 
particularly when Joan Burton was the uh, the minister, yeah. was quite a long way away from what now was accepted. And uh, um, in one sense, I've always said that the person who need, but the politician who needs to be perhaps given a great deal more credit than they were was Kevin Humphreys, because Kevin actually, Absolutely. Kevin introduced the legislation and he was the one that was courageous enough to say self-identification uh, has to be endorsed and in the legislation and that wasn't there when joan was doing it how important do you think that was mm -hmm. i think that is that is a vital part of the legislation yeah. mix because mm -hmm. um nobody can tell a trans person that they're not trans it's yeah. up to the to the trans person to self-identify yeah and i think it was a really progressive piece of legislation to mm -hmm. to allow that um i was I was amazed that that it got through, and I remember reading recently that um, a lot of the anti-trans, the TERFs and so on, um, said that it, had, that it had gone through and there was no debate. That's lies. There was no that's, yeah, com yeah. that's complete lies. You know, you yes, and I were there, yes. we know that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, whereas, whereas marriage equality was out there and there was a vote and so on. And, what the turfs are saying is that oh there should have been a vote a public vote it should have been a change of the constitution or whatever yeah. you know so um i was surprised that it did mm. actually get through mm. um, relatively easily i know there were a lot of debates and a lot of changes needed and thankfully tenny and sarah phillips and and others really belong to and so on really did help mm -hmm. get it to the stage where it was what was it? Maybe, maybe we were one or one or or, or two uh, of the, uh, the most progressive in the world. In the world. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah we yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, Argentina, yeah. I think, had had something similar. Yeah, but yeah. that was it. Yeah, well, all the time you and I were uh, um, involved, Argentina was always the benchmark because they had yes. they had <clears throat> they had endorsed self identification, and uh, and then we came along and. Didn't they make us proud? Is all I can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let's go back to marriage equality, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Philippa, because I always say to you that you and I were there in uh, Balls Bridge in the hotel when that was all announced. Now I did go on to uh, um, uh, Dublin Castle, and you had uh, issues oh. there because of your mother. Yeah. But I always say yes. to people. Uh, the photograph that is the most symbolic I ever took that day, and I took several hundred, was yourself <laughs> and uh, Helen hugging each other. And it meant so much to me because it meant that my friends didn't have to get divorced uh, because of that. Um, how do you feel uh, looking back on that particular day? Was, there, was that an enormous sense of relief or a sense of what we would call self uh, vindication? Mm -hmm yeah it it certainly was um yeah. it, it was relief the because i knew that i wasn't going to divorce helen to get yeah. my gender recognition cert there's absolutely yeah. no way yeah. uh she had she had uh supported me all the way through my transition all the way up to surgery all the way and and afterwards and i i believed in her and i believed in myself and i said okay no matter what happens we're not getting divorced mm -hmm. It was, yeah, it was vindication as well, mm -hmm. because the trans stories were very much put put in the background uh, during the referendum campaign, mm -hmm. because I think the feeling was that marriage equality was one thing, but mm -hmm. to also introduce the, the idea of trans into the mix would mm -hmm. be just too too difficult for sure. for this for society to 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 accept mm -hmm. so i think that's the reason and that hurt a huge amount of my community i know mm -hmm. um but we've got we've got past it and mm -hmm. i think yeah i think we'll see what happens with the gender recognition sir uh gender recognition um review mm -hmm. hopefully i mean that should have been done last year or the year, even the year before i can't remember the exact time scale. Yep. But, because, yeah, yeah. It, it is essentially from a lot of the trans people I've spoken to, particularly those who started from uh, a married background, 
Yours is, I won't say it's unique, but it's very, mm. very close. There's not many couples that have actually stayed together, which is very sad in, in some regards. <laughs> of, of course it is. Yeah. yeah. What is it? 70, 75% of trans people end up divorcing their, their partners. Yeah. And mm. yeah, very, very sad. Um, yeah. And there were, there were times when it was close enough mix. It was, uh, um, it was a case of will I progress or will I stop? Mm -hmm. Could I stop um, without the support of Helen? You know, Ugh, it, yeah. it was a nasty, it was a difficult time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the uh, uh, sections that I found fascinating was your description of initially going to the Gemini Club and then your whole uh, evolution through the Gemini Club. Now, some people might have said, oh, this is a transvestite. Um, yeah. Does it matter for people in that situation? Does it matter really whether they are a transvestite in the sense that they don't do surgery or they are a transgender who does do surgery because my understanding from talking to a lot of people is that they see the, they see the unity of themselves rather than how society uh, projects onto them what's your uh, experience and your recollections from that time uh, uh <laughs> Philippa? well i think deep down I, I like i wasn't willing to face who i really truly was <laughs> Now, maybe, maybe that, maybe that makes me, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps I should have, perhaps I was too, I was too cautious to face who I truly was inside, i.e. Philippa. But when I started going to the Gemini Club, I could have stayed in the club and I could have stayed there with, with the other girls and some guys and just dressed and been myself for an hour or two. And that would have been fine. If I was happy doing that, that's fine. But the very, very first night that I went to Gemini Club, I was taken out by two amazing people, mm -hmm. Gloria and Caroline. And um, both of them looked after me that first night. And I realized it was almost like a light switching on. I realized at that point, hold on, there's more to this than me just dressing in in a skirts and stockings or whatever okay. there's more to this there's more to me than this and it was at that point that i started developing my myself and allowing myself to come to terms with who i truly was mm -hmm. so to get back to your question mix about as long as people are happy as mm -hmm. long as they're accepted by society and not ridiculed and there's no violence there's nothing mm -hmm. like that i think it's so important that people accept others for who they are mm -hmm. um, I got such amazing support from both um, my my family my, my friends and my work colleagues I mm -hmm. work for the property registration sure. authority mm -hmm. for a couple of other a couple of more months and then I retire and uh, it is a case I, I could not have wished for a better uh, a better reception or a better understanding from both my work colleagues and management and the board and so on yeah it's you know i don't know what they're going to do when uh <laughs> when i leave because they 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 promote everything yeah. that i'm doing on their social media account you know and nobody else gets a look in and I, <laughs> I mean uh, come on surely somebody else is doing something uh, interesting with their lives <laughs> yeah can i can i ask you just for the benefit of your wisdom in this regard and i'm not going to uh uh be too candid here in the sense that We've had a number of parties over the last couple of years. We're we're hip people now. We you know we get people. <laughs> we get, we get artistic people come to our parties. Now, one of the people who comes, fabulous chap, love him to bits. I've known him for about ten years, and for the last few years, whenever he's turned up, he said, you know, I remember about two years ago before COVID, he said to me, "Would you mind if I put on a dress?" And I said, no, of course not. Good no, you know, if you like that. And I said, would you like me to get you one? Because we've got a lot of good fashions in this house. And this person, for several times since then, loves nothing better than to sit on our sofa or whatever, um, taking in the world, looking at what's going on, and 
you know, really relaxed and comfortable in that identity. What advice would you give to that person, uh, Philippa? Be at ease with yourself. Um, uh -huh. If it makes you happy, do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it doesn't harm others, do it. Yeah. Uh, I know so many people like, like your friend that dress occasionally and they feel so guilty. And there's nothing to feel guilty about because uh -huh. really, you're just being yourself. It's it's an element of your of your personality of your of who you are, mm -hmm. and nobody should should deny you that. Mm -hmm. the, as long as you're not hurting anybody, sure. You yeah, know, yeah. because when I say say it makes when I when I told Helen initially, back in 1982, it was, um, she was surprised, uh -huh. but she was willing to have an open mind and mm -hmm. to try to understand who I was and this aspect of me at the time, I didn't know who I was. It took me 20 years, mm -hmm. 20 years to yeah. come to terms with it because I simply couldn't, I, I, I could not accept myself mm -hmm. on, for, until the early 2000s, until that uh, momentous occasion when I went to Gemini and then I started moving out and I started going out in public and so on and getting involved in Tenians. So it was, yeah it takes a long time and who knows i mean yeah. your friend might decide that they want to progress a little bit further sure yeah no. and if so there's great support groups around mm. now whereas there weren't back in the day you know yeah god um, yeah well if i could then ask you and again i don't want to uh labor this one but uh what concerns me is that when this person is in our place, they feel so comfortable. This is an accepting environment. Nobody is judgmental. Mm. But at other times, they have been known to be very depressed, uh, to get into uh, drink and all of that. Is that a yeah. common enough uh, reaction to certain people? You know, environment seems to be, as you say, with the Gemini Club, environment seems to be incredibly important. And yet, when that's taken away, uh, people can then uh, unravel to a certain degree. Yeah, people's mental health is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy to get depressed mm -hmm. over just normal day to day activities mm -hmm. and issues. But then if you've got if you've got the, the core of your being, your gender identity or your or your sexuality, then that is something that is so so difficult to come to terms with mm -hmm. and i think it's really important to to realize that if you are getting depressed if you are being driven to drink or drugs or, yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. to seek out some somebody to help mm -hmm. you know um as you know under the rainbow has a number of therapists actually we've got 16 therapists now and we we help people in the LGBT community, mm -hmm. as well as uh, everybody else, not just LGBT issues, but we, 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 we talk to them about whatever issues are, are facing them. Mm -hmm. um, my two colleagues, Gillian okay. and Dermot, are, are excellent. Um, yeah. And yeah. so Under the Rainbow is definitely okay. somewhere to go if you're suffering from any issues like that. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, we'll come back to that one because I want to, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about that towards uh, as we go on, but um, let's move on a bit then, um, um, uh, Philip. But in something I recall, and I, you, you alluded to a certain degree about turfs and things like that, but I can recall about 2013 there was an article appeared in Gay Community News. Um, now, I know there's a different editor now and so on that possibly wouldn't have such an article there now. But the article, and it shocked those of us who were with Tenny at the time, that was saying, mm. should the T be in the LGBT? Um, now, was the community in your, uh, was there a division in the community or has that, if you like, that turfish attitude always been there? Because in generally, uh, generally uh it's it's been opposed to if you like trans women the uh the whole issue of trans men mm. never really gets much of a look in no. but, um, um 
has that been always been there and has it now come back with a vengeance to a certain degree from certain organizations which we're not going to mention yes it has very much um in 2013 that article was was an eye opener because mm. i didn't realize those those attitudes existed uh, mm. and to see them platformed in such a way in mm. gcn yeah was not helpful no. i don't think it was helpful at all there's an argument to be made for having controversial things and raising the issues rather than just uh yeah. keeping everything under the under under the rug but mm -hmm. i do feel that that it was that if you raise those issues if you put the ideas into people's heads then suddenly you've got the likes of the organizations in the uk particularly and they're trying desperately to set them up here mm -hmm. and thankfully ireland seems to be unwilling at the moment to mm -hmm. to accept that sort of attitude uh, and the lgbt is very much solid i do mm -hmm. think that yeah there are people that that that, that would uh disagree with having the tea and because and i mean the reasoning being that lgb is a sexuality se your sexual orientation and t is your gender identity sure and mm -hmm. you can see why but mm -hmm. there are so many commonalities between between the lgb and the t of course and all the all the challenges we faced over the years well mm -hmm. then it seems right to me to face those challenges together going forward yeah. Can I ask you then, and it, uh, in Ireland, the media, and you alluded to it in your book, I know the person that you're talking about when um, one of the, the, uh, the tabloids outed uh, one of the very prominent and uh, highly respected trans people. They did long lenses and all of this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, now, I think the uh, media now in Ireland is a lot more enlightened then, but it was very much nudge, nudge, wink, wink and uh, mm. uh, in those days. How important do you think that self-education is from a, 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 a perspective of the uh, the community? Yeah, I do think it's important. Um, we need to go out and show society in general that we are ordinary people that we just want to be accepted for ourselves for who we are and to the media i think are more informed mm -hmm. there are a few places that and and even radio stations that do try to court controversy and mm -hmm. and um raise issues that shouldn't be raised mm -hmm. um like around the the whole healthcare system uh and say oh you're taking money you're taking spaces away from from uh people who have real issues as if our well-being mm -hmm. and our mental health is not real you know mm -hmm. so from that point of view i think it's important to to realize that that we are just trying to be who we are and to try and get that message across and that's one of the reasons i wrote the book mix mm -hmm. to get the message across to show that I have all this all the same issues and problems as everybody else in the world plus I have my trans identity and my bisexuality sure yeah can I put some, uh, uh, something to you Philip now one of the uh, uh, if you like the memories that strike me from talking about talking to people within the trans community and I know quite a few uh, you are very courageous in the sense that you mentioned a couple of sexual incidents um that's mm. generally in my experience that was generally the taboo subject it wasn't discussed at all and right these well people have a right to privacy mm. the one the, the 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 one that struck me from the book is what i call the birmingham incident <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. did that cause controversy at home uh, when oh, people have been, of course. yeah yeah of course it did yeah. yeah, I mentioned earlier on that Jenny had had said, well, at least it shows that my parents are human. Yeah, that they have their own issues and that, that they had their own, you know. Um, so, yeah, it did. It did. And yeah. it was something mixed that I wasn't particularly proud of, but it was something as well yeah. that I felt I had to explore. And again, it was 
I, believe me, my bi my bisexuality was as much a surprise to me as it was to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I started going out to pubs and clubs and what have you that I realized that I was attracted to men and that they, they were attracted to me. And it it caused I, I mean, it caused depression for me because mm -hmm. every time that I that I went out and any incident that occurred, I'd feel horrendously guilty afterwards. Mm. And it was hardly worth it, to be mm. honest. It was hardly worth it because I'd feel a, an hour, an hour with a guy and then suddenly, uh, you know, I'd be depressed for a week okay. knowing that I'd been unfaithful or whatever, you know? Yeah. So, mm. so yeah, it was, a, it was an issue that, that did cause trouble. Um, yeah. But Helen saw through and she saw the, 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 the bigger picture and she saw where we were going and yeah. Okay, yeah, no, the reason why I say that is because, I mean, uh, you, when you talk about the operation and you talk about the surgery, you go into quite a lot of detail, but I didn't have an issue with that at all because that's part and parcel of the journey. But I mm. did have an issue with the Birmingham one, and the reason why I did is not because you're sleeping with a guy or anything like that, but it always seemed to me that you uh, did that very Irish thing of um, forgiveness is easier to get than permission. And, uh, yeah. and, that, and that was that was my, uh, if you like, that was my lack of comfort with that episode. Um, so uh, that's why I was asking you whether it caused issues at home. Yeah, and indeed, I mean, I'm not proud of myself for that, but uh, yeah, we are. Happened. We it are. Was... 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, we yeah. are who we are. We are yeah. who we are. And as yeah. I say, we are we are curious beings uh, in that sense of the word. We've stayed away from Star Trek and all of that because that really, <laughs> <laughs> that really was uh, very much uh, uh, where, the, if you like, the, uh, the meeting between yourself and Helen came about. Is that still uh, uh, science fiction? Is it still part and parcel of your um, uh, of your existence? It is. Um, in fact, we were just watching a couple of Star Trek episodes last night. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, the, 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 the problem is that I, don't, I have so many interests and I have so many different hobbies to pursue and I don't have enough time. I'm retiring next, uh, probably late January uh, next year. So once I do, I will be able to kind of take stock of everything that, I, that I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. drop out of some things but get involved in other things like for yeah. instance i'm on the board of dublin pride uh unexpectedly i mm -hmm. was asked to be on it and i'm delighted at that opportunity but at the same time i realized that i can't commit too much to sure. to stuff like that because i have other interests that i want of to course follow. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as a retired person, I'm convinced you'll uh, uh, you'll find more and more time to do all those other things that you haven't had time to do up to now. Yeah. Can I can I come back to something else? And I think it doesn't mm -hmm. get enough coverage in this country, and that is, is that like uh, women who have to uh, go to London with the suitcase for the termination, you also had to go to London with the suitcase, but for a different reason. Um, Clearly, we have a lot of catching up to do in terms of trans health care in this country. What's your take on this, the current status for uh, trans health care support? Well, Noah Halpin is doing a great job um, yeah. in mm. highlighting the issues around trans health care. And he's far more capable of, of expressing the issues because, yeah. thankfully, I don't have any uh, involvement with, with trans health care uh, yeah. now. But I mean, even back to 10 years ago, when I came back from from um, England, having had surgery and I needed a minor medical uh, procedure to to tidy up everything, basically, um, it was a case of nobody would. Well, the first few nurses or doctors that I that I approached wouldn't touch me once no. they heard that I was trans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's just that's just unreal. You treat the patient in front of you, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, and they said, "Oh no, 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 we're not, we're not familiar with the with the subject." Mm -hmm. And it's only got worse since then, because it took me probably eighteen months mm -hmm. to get to surgery from the time that I decided, mm -hmm. and that involved uh, uh, letters to my TD, who was a minister mm -hmm. at the time, and I hated doing that. I hated. 
mm. asking somebody to intervene on my behalf. I wanted to do it myself, but I had no choice. Now it's getting absolutely ridiculous. And I've heard it's taking up to 10 years mm -hmm. for people to get appointments. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough. I mean, when I went to my first appointment with the psychologist, it took uh, it took three months for me mm -hmm. to get that. And then I got uh, an appointment in Lachlanstown a couple of months later. Now it's what, 10 years mm -hmm. to be to be to be put on the on the waiting list and to be seen by a consultant yeah. that is just not right yeah. and i know we've lots of other issues in the health service and so on but we're as valid as anybody else absolutely no I do. one of the reasons why i asked that is that uh, particularly with the trans men i know almost uh exclusively they've all had to go abroad to have a mm. double mastectomy uh i don't know if they even do that here um do you have any knowledge of that, Philippa? Uh, to be honest, Mix, I don't. Um, I it's 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 an area of, of healthcare that I'm not not familiar with. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. like people go, people go, trans women go to the likes of Thailand or 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 elsewhere. Apart from, and they they do it privately. Mm -hmm. And if you can afford it, and if it's what you want, fine, do that. I always felt that it was my entitlement to to be part because i was an irish citizen i paid my taxes you know i was entitled to my surgery being paid for by, by the hse mm -hmm. um and i was adamant about that proper order proper order just moving on slightly philip but the one thing i also remember is uh you're a fan of cycling and uh and <laughs> uh, and you after your uh, surgery you took part in competitive cycling how important was it that you were able to continue that because i know that that was a major issue before the gender reg legislation uh, uh, recognition legislation was passed how important was that to you well, I wanted to be as fit as possible for my surgery. So mm -hmm. that's why I got, got involved and I joined a club and I was fully accepted by the by the, the women in the club. Mm -hmm. And we we did some semi semi competitive uh, races mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but it was after that, uh, when I saw that the World Gay Games were on in Paris in 2018, mm -hmm. and I, I wrote to the person involved in organizing the Team Ireland, and from that point on, then I started to take cycling really, really seriously. I got a, an Italian coach who was brilliant. Um, mm. And he he brought me up to a totally different level. Okay. And then I ended up winning a couple of medals and so on at the World Gay Games, which was amazing. Yeah. I mean, and to stand on a podium with the Irish flag around me was just wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. wow. <laughs> If I remember correctly, we're all so proud of you because you won a silver medal, or at least several silver medals, did you not? Two silver and one bronze. Yeah. Ah, congratulations. <laughs> what can I thank say? You, thank you. Yeah, no, I could, because again, just going back to the original proposals that came through with Joan Burton and uh, Joanna mm. Tuffy, they basically wanted to leave that to the sporting authorities rather than uh, eventually i think they went with the olympic standard or what was the olympic yeah. standard um uh, but because i can remember uh, somebody who we would both know all she wanted to do was play golf and continue to play golf and was terrified <laughs> that they were going to yeah, be banned yeah, yeah. yeah i but, know who you mean yeah oh uh, yeah so, uh, so how do you feel when you see something like um the way they're treating Castor Semenya. Now, Castor isn't a uh, trans. Castor is a person who has a high testosterone level. And there's, there were two sprinters in the last Olympics mm. that they said, oh, yeah, you can do the 400 meters, but you can't. You know, it was nonsense sort of stuff. Yeah. How do you yeah. feel for those people when you hear that? It's so frustrating, Mix, because um, you're, we're either, like, my, my, I have a passport, I have a gender recognition cert, and I have my birth cert this the the state sees me as female therefore i should be able to compete as female wherever Absolutely. i do wherever mm -hmm. i go um but it's it's very unfair to look at at trans women and say oh you've got an unfair advantage because you were you you had a male body up to whenever you transitioned yeah. Uh, like my, I know my hormone levels are 
at or below normal female levels. Yeah. I have virtually no testosterone in my body. So I don't have any advantage there. I know yeah. I don't have any yeah. advantage. Yeah. The argument is that, yeah, the muscles and the uh, and the body shape and so on give you an advantage, in this, uh, an historical advantage. But to be honest, I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's it's a case of just transphobia. Yeah. It's yeah. just transphobia. And you see some of the comments online and so on and yeah. and from and from very prominent people mm-hmm. about trans trans sports sports people yeah. um i met at a meeting in in london uh, rachel mckinnon who uh, is a very famous uh, trans cyclist she's mm-hmm. a world champion actually she's one of the very very few trans people who have who have actually won anything mm-hmm. i mean i won i won my medals at the world gay games which is a lot lot less lot smaller than the olympics it's not fair to say that somebody has an advantage because of their height i mean you look or 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 their body shape or whatever you look at michael uh, what was it michael phelps the the swimmer yeah he was he he trained he 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 was an amazing character but would it be fair to give him a disadvantage because he was Mm -hmm. six foot six or whatever yeah you know um so I, th- I think trans women have to be seen in that light yeah. that we are women and okay so we might have a little bit more muscle or whatever but yeah i, th- well, I genuinely feel that like. well that whole prejudice was blown out of the water in the uh the last olympics when the new zealand weightlifter they were all complaining yeah. and um, she didn't uh it was a chinese woman who won the medals you know the gold medal yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Moving on then, Philippa, I just want to ask you a couple of more things. Under the Rainbow, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> that's a relatively recent organisation. Tell us about it and how it came about and what its services are. Right. Well, basically, Mix, what we do is it was set up about three, almost three years ago, two and a half years ago now. And I was invited to a breakfast with mm-hmm. uh, Gillian Fagan and Dermot McCarthy. Dermot McCarthy being involved in sporting pride as well mm-hmm. and they just wanted my advice as part of the LGBTQ community mm-hmm. so I went along to this meeting and I, it was it was not it was just general chat to start with and then they said well we're thinking of setting up a company it'll it'll revolve around diversity inclusion and well-being do you want to be a director and I went well uh okay <laughs> that was the last thing i was expecting from this breakfast mm-hmm. meeting and from that point on then we just developed and we started taking on corporate clients and we started taking on community um clients and basically it's a robin hood business model where we charge the corporates and we do the community mm-hmm. ones for free or just whatever. basic mm-hmm. expenses yeah, yeah whatever mm-hmm. yeah. and it's Initially, it was it was LGBTQ, but now it's a much, much uh, broader uh, range of services that we can produce. Uh, uh, Gillian is particularly passionate about intersectionality and feminism. And so there's all those sort of areas that we go into the corporates and explain uh, how important it is to to be inclusive and to accept people for who they are we always bring in a little bit of lgbt into the conversation as well just to show people that there's so many different aspects to to uh your work life balance particularly and to to show how important it is that people bring their true selves to work um my uh head of operations in the property registration authority when we set up our diversity program there six six five years ago um she was concerned about sick leave and since we introduced this program the sick leave has dropped within the office and this is what what we do we 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 show that those statistics to companies and we say look this is a perfect example of what happens um when you start encouraging people to be diverse and to be inclusive and to to basically bring their whole selves to work mm-hmm. i've got to finish on this note philippa the book mm-hmm. is called my name is philippa 
when they undoubtedly come to make the movie of it, who would you like? <laughs> who would you like to play? Who would you like to play, Philip Ryder? Oh no! Don't say that! Don't say that! Oh God! Um, <laughs> yeah, I I couldn't answer that. I I yeah. want to play myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's, it's it great. It would translate very easily uh, to uh, to uh, the big screen, would it not, or even the small screen? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, I know my I know my publishers are looking at different avenues to to promote the story, not necessarily just the book, but the story. Yeah. So who knows, mix in the future? Okay. <laughs> just finally, uh, for people, obviously you can get it in bookshops. Where else can it be uh, uh, acquired, as we say, particularly for overseas uh, people? Yeah. Um, Book Depository, mm. the Waterstones website, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, and Mercier Press, mercierpress.ie. Mm. Yeah. Uh, all of those have, have uh, copies available. And so as I say... Is yeah. there a Kindle version? Oh, sorry. Yes, there's a Kindle version as well. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Look, look, you're to be congratulated. It's a major achievement. You're, uh, you've made a, a, a very lasting legacy for, um, you know, compared to the Ireland that we grew up in. And it's a, not only it's a tribute to yourself, but it's also a tribute to Helen and a tribute to Jenny as well. I've known you for about a decade. Uh, you're one of the finest people in uh, in Ireland, and it's been an absolute delight talking to you today, as I knew it would. <laughs> thank you uh, so much, Mix, and thank you for all your work in the community as well. It's, it's been invaluable. And this yeah. this ra this radio station is, is just amazing for doing it. Yeah. Philippa Ryder, it's been uh, a delight to talk to you today. Take care, and uh, we'll talk to you in retirement in a, in a few months' time. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye, you too. Friends of Dorothy, come out off the sidewalk and onto the street to the sound of those legendary feet. Sure, Auntie M, I'm anti establishment. They took my name and the clothes I own. They broke our hearts, but not our souls. When there's no place like home. Like